I heard God oper say two words to me as I operated this week. Let's go, Frank. I heard God say, access granted. I didn't understand why God was putting that in my belly, but when I got here today, because when he gave me this word, I thought there would be such an open flow in today's worship. But the same burden that God allowed me to experience in preparation has manifested itself here today. This is no knock to you. I'm talking about personal spiritual stuff. But there is a kind of access that God wants to give us. in his power that we have not experienced before. That's it. Why are you all <laughs> Yes, God. Mm -hmm. The sad reality is, ooh, ha -ba -ba oh, Jesus. <laughs> is that many of us are trying to operate off an oil that has reached its expiration date. In other words, when something is aspired in the spirit, it is not intended for it to be renewed. The only thing that's intended for to be renewed in the spirit is your mind, not your operation. Created me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. In other words, God, that word heart is also synonymous with mind and the body. And so God wants to create in you something new, but you're still trying to flow on an oil that expired in 2010, 2015, 1980, and 1970. But here is the problem that God showed me. We are dealing with a different kind and kinds of demons. Who? Y'all hear what I'm saying? God said, Anthony, the territory. And this is what I got. I'm just being prophetic and I'm going to get in my teaching. God said that some demons are regional. In other words, St. Louis has its own set of demons that New Orleans don't deal with. That's why you can't pastor in St. Louis like you would in New Orleans. Because there's a custom kind of oil tailored to expose and denounce and renounce demons. Yes. And we are situated perfectly as a church to enter into a place of God that is serving as the blueprint for this region. I know it's kind of heavy, but I'm going to break it down. In other words, God is tailoring our church yes. to be a blueprint that will enact change in the spiritual realm for this entire region. Yes, sir. But what happens, I don't know if you all ever had alterations. I personally don't like the worst stuff that's not altered. And so when I buy certain things, when I put it on, mama, it does not fit. Some people would just wear it with their pants hanging over their shoes. Some people would allow their sleeves to hang over their wrist. And it's not the outfit. The outfit looked good, but the fact that you did not pay the cost to tailor it it infected and affected your entire look. But I actually looked at my seamstress one day, tailor my clothing. I had to go through a fitting. In other words, I had to go through something that determined it ain't ready yet. And, and after my tailor took me through a fitting, the tailor said, give it to me. And when she said, give it to me, she said, come back in a week and it'll be ready. In other words, I got to work on something for a period of time. 
before it gets back on your body. And sometimes we desire to put stuff on us that has not been properly produced yet. But I watched her in the spirit realm, or I watched her in the natural realm, tailor my clothes one day. What she did is, I said, let me see it. She began to first cut the pan leg. She didn't just hem it. She cut it. I said, why didn't you just not hem it? She said, because if I hemmed it, you will still see the imperfections. So I got to cut the imperfections off so that when you wear it on your leg, other folks will not be privy to what it used to look like before I put my hand on it. And so every now and then, God got to cut some stuff on us and cut some stuff within us and cut some stuff around us and cut some stuff in between us. And God said, don't put it on before it's been cut. But not only did she cut it, she began to take it through the sewing machine. And the needle started doing doing the work and all she was doing is just pushing it through because she realized that I've done my part now there's something more powerful than me that need to do their part here's what I'm trying to say God said sometimes we got to let him be the sewing machine on our spirituality and while we trying to figure it out, he's already worked it out. I need about 20 of y'all to thank God that he's already worked on your situation. And all you need to do is let him work. Which brings me to my topic of access granted. I'm a huge fan of the TV series Grey's Anatomy. Anybody ever seen that before? It's been on a long time, but I still fool with Shonda on this particular series. And I was looking at an episode the other day, and there was a doctor who decided to go rogue. In other words, did not follow the instruction. The doctor decided to enact a type of behavior that was not conducive to harmony in the flow of the hospital. And so the director called the doctor to the office and had a casual conversation with the, uh, with the person who went rogue, the doctor who went rogue, and sent this rogue doctor by their way. Didn't really say anything intentional, didn't really say anything specific. Just asked the rogue doctor, why did you do that? The rogue doctor explanation to me seemed sufficient, but obviously it was not because it went against what was conducive for a healthy flow. And so the rogue doctor, the next day, met in the parking lot with another doctor. Both of the doctors had perfect credentials. Both of the doctors had pristine lab coats. And both of the doctors had key cards to get into the door. And so while they were drinking coffee and just chopping it up like nothing has never happened, the rogue doctor takes our fair key card and put it on the key fob and it was red and it beeped and it said Arr. she said wait a minute she started trying to wipe it off and blow it off trying to see if she had coffee on it and put it on the key card again and said Arr. so the other doctor said let me try it the other doctor took their key card off that did not go rogue and put it on the key card key fob thing and it was green, bing, and the doors open. They both had credentials. They both had the perfect pristine lab coat. 
they both had key cards that looked just alike. But one of them had access and another one didn't. And the one that did not have access did not have access because they fell out of alignment with what was supposed to be going on. And I'm here to tell you that God told me to tell my people that they cannot receive the kingly or kingdom benefits that they desire when they're out of alignment. And that's why when they put their spiritual key card into the life of the spiritual realm, it say access denied because they're out of alignment. You can sing and be out of alignment. You can preach and be out of alignment. You can play an instrument and be out of alignment. You can be a greeter and be out of alignment. You can be a deacon and be out of alignment because a title does not place us in alignment. There is a kind of obedience that God is calling for and not going wrong and doing things our way when God said, I am the way. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and say, are you out of alignment? In other words, are you continually trying to do things your way? Can you receive this word prophetically? Here's what God told me to tell you. He said, tell my people, I want to give them a kind of access of mind-blowing kingdom benefits. But I need for them to discontinue their rogue behavior. Behavior in this season is connected to your access. Don't think you can live one type of way and just one small prayer, God is gonna eradicate all of that mess and catapult you above those who have been on their knees, who have been sacrificing, and who have been worshiping at a very high level. There is a price to pay, and I need for us to stop trying to play God cheap, acting like we have all the knowledge when we really don't. There are too many raw believers in the kingdom. There are too many people who want to do it their way. If I did it my way every time, I'd be a complete mess. Because the only way that matters is God's way. And I want my spiritual key card to work. And so God said, tell the people to consider their behavior. Tell people to consider what they do between Sundays. There are too many Sunday only saints. Are oh, you real good at save on Sunday? I love you Jesus, I worship, you know the words and you know all that. But what happens when the temptation comes on Monday? What happens when that attitude start brewing up on Tuesday? What happens when the curse words come out of your lips on Wednesday? What happens when you don't know what your, where your bed is on Thursday? Come on here, help me, Holy Ghost. What happens when you're getting high on Friday? Come on, drunk on Saturday. And then you come to church and expect the preacher to preach all that out of you in 45 minutes. It's impossible. And so our behavior becomes a burden on the influx in which God is trying to produce in the house. Look at your neighbor and say, it's in your behavior. It's in your behavior. I said, God, I thought this was going to be a shouting sermon. He says, you got to tell them how to get access. See, here's what preaching has failed. They have preached cherry, but they have not given you enough substance. And so I'm trying to deal with a silent killer in the house. One that's secretly trying to destroy that which God has established. And by the house, I don't mean the new church. I'm talking about the body. And so God said, I want to give them kingdom access, kingdom benefits, but I need for them to eradicate mind 
I need for them to eradicate their rogue behavior. And so I said, God, speak to me very clearly because I don't want to be of self. I don't want to have any personal perspectives in this sermon. I don't want to use my theological training. God, I want you to speak through me from the text that what I say is ordained. When you speak, I speak. When you tell me to be silent, I'll be silent because my knowledge does not matter in this season. And that's the problem. Many of us are trying to live off knowledge and not the anointing. That's why we sound and look good, but ain't nobody getting changed. That's why we sound and look good, but ain't nobody hearts are transformed. That's why we sound and look good, but ain't nobody moving. That's why we sound and look good, but ain't nothing happening. Because you have to have something associated with knowledge. Because the Bible says that knowledge by itself puffeth you up. In other words, it makes you think you're more than what you are. And what did Paul say? Paul said, I got a thought in my flesh. It's a messenger from Satan that came to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. In other words, he's saying, God is humbling me with this thought unless I get full of myself. And the reason why some of us are pricked in the spirit, because God is trying to humble our arrogance. I don't care what your degree say, what your certification say, what none of that say. It does not matter in the spirit. And so here, God said, tell my people, I want to grant them access, but there's three things I need from them. Number one, God said, I need, let's move, uh, Frank. He said, I need your senses. <laughs> Can I just talk like God gave it to me? I need your senses. And so senses, in terms of the body, comes in five different categories. And y'all know this from science, right? What are they? You got taste, you got hearing, you got sight, you got smell, and you got touch. God said, tell my people that I don't want their natural senses, but I need them to think spiritual. And so... As I press this point, I'm in no way being insensitive to anyone who have one of their five senses operating in impairment. In other words, you can't see, you have eye problems, you have ear problems. No, I'm not talking about you, so I'm helping you. Think spiritual. God said, I need your senses if you want access, because if you keep your senses to yourself, your card will not work. How did he say it? Let's move. Genesis chapter 12. Here we go. I'm ready to preach. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram. Go back. Now the Lord what? The Lord said. The Lord said. The Lord said. said. Whoa, I feel it, Holy Ghost. The Lord said to Abram. I can stay there all day. You know why that's significant in terms of sensing? Because the phrase the Lord said suggests Abram had to give God his sense of hearing because God was talking. In other words, he was saying, you cannot get access if I do not have your ear. I need from you or for you to hear from me. Beloved, perhaps our access has been denied because of the sources we give our ear to. Can I ask you as I help all of us get delivered? Who have you been giving your ear to? You must protect what goes in your ear. Because what goes in my ear transforms my mind and what transforms my mind makes me matriculate in action. Because I heard it, I believed it and perceived it and then I became it. 
And so if I'm giving everybody my ear, that means that somebody is going to start sending messages that are contradictory to where God wants me to be. And so I'm listening to people who does not have the credentials in the spiritual realm to really speak into me and I'll start to think that they are from God because they have godly like vocabulary. Everybody that has a godly like vocabulary is not of God. In other words, the enemy knows scripture. The devil knows the Bible. Y'all got to hear me like I'm trying to tell you. The enemy knows how to pontificate, know how to articulate, and know how to speak things that sounds good. Oftentimes we fall in love with what people say and not what they do. Here it is. Why do you love me? Because I told you. Why am I in love with you? Because I just want to hear it. Baby, tell me you love me. Baby, you tell me you love me. Baby, just say it to me. Baby, just do this. I remember when we was coming up in high school, we would stay on the phone all night long, fall asleep and wake up and say, oh, baby, are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. I just want to hear you in my ear. But most of those relationships did not last into our adult life. Why? Because just because they said it does not mean it has longevity. And we are so enticed by hearing stuff. But but we do not want to hear correction. As long as you puffing me up, as long as you giving me an boy and at a girl, I'm good. But as soon as correction takes place, everybody is upset. Why is that? Because victory is in submitting to correction. stuff that's going to challenge me not that's going to caress my ego because if my ego continuously be caressed then that means it arrived before my body and if my ego arrives before my body God cannot jump into me that's why Paul said do not be conformed to this world ego but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind the limitation of ego that you may be able to prove God told me to tell you in this season, consider who you give your ear to. Anybody feeling what I'm dealing right now? Okay, okay, okay. He says, Abraham, or Abram at this time, I want to talk to you, but you got to hear me. He says, now I'm ready, Frank. He says in verse 1, he says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. He says, I need you to hear me, but Phil, now I'm adding a second sense because he says, now that I got your ear, here is the instructions, or here are the instructions. He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. That word show moves us from hearing to seeing. He didn't say go from your people's house to a land that you already see. He says, where I'm going to take you, you don't know. But I'm going to show it to you. Oh my God. In other words, he's saying that the spirituality in your eyesight, my brothers and sisters, requires a certain level of trust. He says, Abram, I need for you to trust me to leave what's comfortable to see something better. He said, you have been comfortable in the land with your kindred. You've been comfortable in the land with your family. Come on, don't fall asleep on me. I need you to pull on me. Wake up, wake up. Look at your neighbor say, get up. There's a good point here. I see some of y'all dogs. Now that's the devil. Get up. Here it is. He says, he says, what's comfortable is you stand in that spot. But you stand in that spot still has you in depression. You stand in that spot still has you broke. You stand in that spot still has you suffering. You stand in that spot still have you going nowhere, stagnant. He says, I need for you to open up your eyes. Give me your eyes so that I can show you something better. Because it ain't that it hurts us. It's that we're afraid to move out of what's comfortable. 
That's why we'll stay in relationships when they still talk to us bad. Because we become comfortable with the partner. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why we'll stay in stuff but that even though we ain't progressing, why are you still in those spaces? You complain about your income all the time. Boy, this thing ain't paying me enough. This thing ain't doing this. This thing ain't doing this. You've been doing that for five years. Maybe God wants to show you something better, but you have to be able to hear him. Can I tell you this? I got to get somewhere with this. Don't allow people to prescribe God's sound to your ear. In other words, there is no one size fit all prescription on how to hear God. I know people have written books on that and I know people have profited on that but there's no A, B, C, D steps to hearing God but the real step to hearing God my brothers and sisters is making sure you're submitted to God you gotta be careful when you say God said this because oftentimes we pull people away from the faith because we've said God said it when it was really ourself. And then when it don't come to pass, you're mad at God, but God said, I never told you to say what I said because I can say it myself. In other words, I don't need your help to speak. I just need you to listen and I need you to follow me and trust me and trust the process. Here's what I hear God saying in the spirit. I need everybody in this room to get this. God said in this season of your life, if you're going to have access granted, you must trust the process. Trust it when you can't trace it. Trust it when it don't feel good. Trust it when you don't understand it. Trust it when you don't see it. Trust it when it don't seem like a reality. Trust it when it seems like it's not going to happen. Trust it even though you're broke. Trust it even though you're sick. Trust it even though you're down. Trust it when you're in. Trust it when you're out. Because I'm trying to get you to a level where you're so vulnerable that you have no other choice but to trust me. You have no other choice but to trust me. I did not start being elevated to God until I took my hand out of it. It's one thing to be bright, but it's another thing to think you're smarter than God. You cannot be smarter than the mind creator. You cannot be smarter than the divine. You cannot be smarter than God. And some of us have a kind of arrogance that will suggest that we're better than God. And what God will do is start snatching stuff from you. You'll find yourself getting fired when you didn't do nothing. You'll find yourself crying when ain't nothing sad. You'll find yourself because God will pull the rug from under us if we act like we're God. And so we begin to engage in ungodly stuff. We begin to create narratives that God did not author authorize us to pen and so what happens is we have just completed after next week the first half of our story for 2024 and if I read your pages how much of it is, is of God and how much of it is of you because God said most of our story on the first half had nothing to do with me because he or she that has an ear, let them hear. What are you going to do when the pastor is not available to give you a prophetic word? What are you going to do when a pastor needs to take a vacation like y'all be taking all the time? What are you going to do when the pastor can't sing your favorite song? What are you going to do when the pastor can't get you ready, get you right? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when God said, here's the atmosphere, now you shift it in the spirit. Here's the atmosphere, now you make it change. Here's the atmosphere of your life. Here's the atmosphere you need to let your prayer and let your sacrifice do it. But God said, the only way you're going to be able to do that if you trust me with your vision. I know a lot of us got goals, but can I ask you a question? How much of God is in your goals? And see, here's what the enemy will do. The enemy will position you where you'll think you're doing the right thing. And then all of a sudden, you get hit with a whirlwind. And now, 
you have lost your confidence, you have lost your commitment, you have lost your dedication, and now you're making irrational decisions because you fell out of alignment with God. And so you cannot make righteous decisions without righteous relationship. Man, I need to teach this on Bible study. I think it's too heavy for Sunday morning, but I'm going to keep pressing. You cannot make righteous decisions. I can almost tell what your week been like based off you, how you walk in here. Come on, pray. Now, y'all know that ceiling been black since we painted it, and some of y'all still looking at it. It ain't changing colors today, church. I'm seeing some of y'all look at the ceiling. It ain't changing colors. Get this word in you and be better. God said, I need for you to give me your senses. I need for you to give me your sight. I need for you to give me your ear. And I need for you to go, get this now, on a talking fast. Some of us need to go on a period of time where we only talk when we have to. And that also means texting because texting is a contemporary form of, of talking. Because we spend so much time talking to people, talking to things, talking to circumstances, and texting that God does not have enough time to get our ear. And so what happens is what translates from what we see in the text and the DMs and what we hear on the phone and what we read on the emails now becomes our God. And the person that's sending them are not always ordained by God. Every prophet is not called to you. I understand in the prophet realm, we have assignments. Yes, you have local prophets in the church. You have regional prophets for Midwest. You have national prophets for the country. You have global prophets for internationally. Everybody does not operate in each office. And so, no, we don't have a word for you today because that's not our assignment. Ed, am I too heavy? Please tell me. Do I need to come down? Because I think I'm losing them. Am I right? Okay, all right. I'm feeling, I'm feeling, feel, I'm feeling something. I don't know. Here we go. Uh, can I? <laughs> I like this stage, amen. It, it keeps me away from you, but I want to come to you. Can I ask you a question? Do you know your assignment? Because Abram's assignment really was to be Israel's archetype. In other words, he was the key ancestor and his obedience set the stage for everything that would become the blessings of God. And if Abram would have been out of order, then the whole descendants of Abraham would have missed out. Don't you know that some of the decisions you make will affect your offsprings and your family members and some of our kids are suffering because of the decisions we made? And some of y'all are suffering because you have not broken the generational curse of your parents and your grandparents and you still walking in bondage because you let that thing fester over you. You got to follow the blessings of Abram. In other words, you got to break the curse. You are not your mama. You are not your daddy. You are not your grandmama. You are a child of the living God. You are set apart to do great things. Break it now. I said break it right now. I got to surrender my sight to God, my ears to God, so I would not be off, not, not of God. I can trace some of your trauma back to your genealogy. And some of us have not even met the great great grandparents that did not renounce that spirit and it's in us now. But what happens is when I receive Christ into my life, I am now under the spirit of adoption. 
And it ain't that kind of doctrine that I'm just trying to make money. In other words, Christ regenerates me by his blood. Oh my God. In other words, my blood type is no longer Makah, but my blood type is Christ. In other words, I don't have the DNA of a Makah. So I don't care if they was drug users, drug pushers, womanizers, hoes, pimps, and all of that. That is not my DNA. My DNA is a man of God with integrity because I've been born again by the blood of the Lamb. I got Christ in me. Somebody told me one day, you just like those macaws. I said, the devil is a liar. Whatever I did, I denounce it now because I don't want to be known by evil or by name that is not saturated in the Holy Spirit. And it's my job to impute that in my son so he can impute it in his kids. And if I did something wrong, he has to denounce me in the spirit. Can I say that the reason why some of us are in poverty because you did not break the generational curse of poverty? Some of us can't pay our bills and we mismanage money because the people in our family mismanage money. You got to break it now. I know I'm preaching it better than you responding. You got to break it. Who told you you can't be rich? Who told you you can't have another level? Who told you you can't have a better job? Who told you you can't have greater anointing? Great as he that is in you, that the enemy is in the world. I cast down generational curses. I cast it down. You are not what they said you are. Even if you've done it, you're better than that. Own the decision that you made that was improper and flip it. Flip it. I hear God saying, I want to flip it in the house. Oh my God. I hear God said I want to flip it I got a flipping anointing is there anybody who's going to flip the curse is there anybody going to flip the pain is there anybody going to flip the suffering I need to where you at you going to flip it God is ready to flip it somebody shout out senses Nikita you sure you put the right time on there I feel like I'm almost done my clock telling me I got to slow down. The next thing you need, God said, in order to get access granted, you not only, I not only want your senses, secondly, I want your surrender. God said, tell my people it's quite arrogant to think that I'm going to give them something when they're not completely surrendered. I come against Dr. Johnson this Spirit of entitlement that has infiltrated the body of Christ. Dr. Culkin, people desire all that they're not prepped for. They desire a stage that they're not qualified for. They desire to offer opinions that they have no sufficient spiritual evidence to offer. I'm talking to the you got this, put this camera on me because I, I don't want to talk to this camera right here. It looks like it's pointing right at me. Hey, camera. Tell the people when they see this again, be careful when they think that they deserve something that they have not been qualified to have. Because what we don't understand is when you reach certain dimensions, it's a whole nother level of spiritual warfare. It's a whole nother level of demonology. It's a whole nother level of witches. I have literally seen witches. I ain't talking about this spiritual talk. I'm talking about witches in the form of flesh. People operating in witchcraft that have come to try to attack me. There are witches, there are warlocks, and there are demons. Do you know, oh my God, that whenever the army of God set forth, there's also a signal that is sent to hell to dispatch his or her army. In other words, when we said we was an army, the devil said, watch this, I got demons that's gonna prove you're not. Did you know that the reason why sometimes we get attacked 
is because the enemy and hell is upset you ain't lived until you made hell upset if hell is pleased with you that means you are a resident of hell but when you start going through all kind of stuff and stuff start pressing on you you know you starting to live right why because hell has been alerted to knock you off of your game and the only thing that's going to help you is your surrender. It's hard to surrender when I'm trying to do it myself. He says, he said, he said in verse 2, he says, get this, he said, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I'll make your name great. That's the promise of God given to Abraham. Abram. Now we must be careful not to mistake what God told Abram as to what God is saying to you. That's, bo- that's, that, that's, that's where we get in trouble with biblical interpretation. We read a scripture and immediately say, that's what the Bible said. But did it really say that to you? The text says God said to Abram. Now you do have permission to read the scripture autobiographically. In other words, you can interpolate and insert yourself in scripture, but realize that's what you're doing. It's a testimony, but does not mean it's a testament. This is the Old Testament. There's a difference from a testament than a te- Oh my God. Than a testimony. But there is a principle that we can pull from this. Oh, preach, man, preach. He says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. God tells Abram, you and that that is attached to you will bespeak of greatness. He says, why? Because I am going to do it. He didn't say, Abram, you going to make your name you going to be a great nation. See, sometimes we say stuff and we don't realize that we are not giving God God's credit. When we say, I'm going to do this. I'm busting out. I'm coming out. I'm going to make moves. And that's all good preacher talk. Yeah, God, I'm doing it all right now. No! You are merely filthy rags. And all of your righteousness are too without God. We are operating too much with the eyeness of us and not the eyeness of him. He says, in context, Abram, if you will allow me with your surrender to me, I will in return reward your allowance and I will make you a great nation. I will make your I will make your name great. I will make your descendants great. I will bless you. Abraham, this level, Abram, this level of success or access requires you to surrender to me. Could it be that your name, your goals, your dreams have limited access? or no access because your surrender to God has been limited or non-existent. If God wants me to prosper, Norman, here's my question I got to ask. Then why are we not prospering? If God wants us to elevate, then why are we not elevating? Either it's binary. It's one or two answers. It's either God or us. And I'm always side with God. I'm, I'm always side with you, I mean. In other words, it's you. He says, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you a great nation. In other words, I want to propel you. I want to catapult you. I want to move you into greatness. But I need your surrender. Here's what God told me. He said, the church is suffering from the disease of artificial surrender. Because surrender has nothing to do with your hand posture in worship. 
Man, I was taught all these years that when we lift our hands, they surrender. God said, you got a lot of lifted, unsurrendered people, a lot of lifted hands. In other words, my personal posture has not, did nothing to do with surrender. Surrender comes, get this now, with my heart posture. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And one of the ways you can error when you in authority, when God elevates you into certain offices, pastor, prophet, teacher, you can begin to come attracted to the personality with a disregard for their heart. And you start mistaking their demeanor for their heart. In other words, in order to sense the relevancy of one who has been ordained by God, you cannot look at their presentation. You got to look at their internal fortitude. You got to ask God, what is their heart saying? Because the greatest preacher, the greatest prophet will always be subject to error if they're not careful. But we have to learn how to give them grace. If we want God to give us grace. He says, Abram, you're not going to do everything right, but I'm still going to make your name great. Isn't it so wonderful if we serve a God that is filthy as we been? Think about it. The stuff you really done, the griminess, the nastiness, you don't deserve to even be sitting in that seat. But you came here, you didn't even check under that seat to make sure it was going to hold you. You just plopped down in it. You know why? Because you trust that the money we pay for that seat will hold you. In other words, oftentimes we have more trust in a seat than we have in God. Because you didn't question the seat, but we always questioning God. Lord, when is this thing going to get better? Oh my God. Lord, when is it going to change? Lord, 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 Lord. Lord said, I want to hear adoration instead of complaining. Why don't you adore me, esteem me? Don't tell me what you ain't got. Tell me who I've been to you. Don't tell me what you ain't got. Tell me what I've done for you. Don't tell me what you don't have. Tell me how much you believe in me. God said, I am attracted to those who speak well of me and not complain about me. I said, Lord... There's some stuff that I'm believing you for that has not happened yet. And you know what God told me? He said, belief is not good enough. He said, because you can believe me because I am God, but you're not surrendered to me because I am God. In other words, what are you willing to give up? And who are you willing to give up? Some of y'all don't want to let go of your favorite demon. You let two of them go, but that favorite one, you don't want to let go. Oh, my God. I need that favorite demon that's keeping you in trauma. That favorite demon that's keeping you from moving. Yeah, that demon is cute, sexy, fine, good. All of that. That demon, that situation, not even a person, that situation is attractive. It's keeping you where you want to. That, 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 that demon is saturated intoxication. Because whenever I get to a point where I have to be intoxicated to get rid of the realities of my world, now I've been demonized by something I got to pay to get. So I'm literally paying to kill myself. How to get away with murder. I get away with murder by holding on to my favorite demon that's killing me. Lord, I hope I, I hope I ain't messed up today, but if I did, I believe in you, I trust in you. God won't surrender. He says, he says, Abram, he says, I need you to surrender to me so I can make your name great. Let me tell you, God, God is, boy, I wish y'all could see what God's saying. 
if God, God don't operate like this all the time, but sometimes God just want to kick him. Get, get your butt in alignment so I can give you what you've been praying for. Yep. How is it, Tanya, that God is answering somebody else's prayer but ain't answering mine? If he the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Now, Pastor, are you trying to tell me that it's me? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. God said, I want your senses. I want your surrender, and we gone on this one. He said, lastly, I need your situation. I got to have your situation. Or situations. I need your situations. Frank, let me see the other verse. Look what he said. He says, Ver- no, go back, go back. Come on, just go back. Hey, stay right there. Amen. Stay with me. Amen. I need you to have some anointing on them clicks. We're going to practice next week. I need you to have some anointing on them clicks. Here we go. Genesis 12, verse 3. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I'm so glad when I can preach Bible, I don't have to say it myself. So don't get mad at me. Get mad at the writer. He says, and the one who curses you, not you go mess with him. We are like little petty kids in the spirit. I got to get my lick back. Let me get my tap back. You tag me. You talked about me. You lied on me. So I got to get my lick back. No. No. That is situation. The situation is they've done you wrong. The situation is they have not esteemed you. The situation is they have not recognized your giftings. But you go talk about your boss to the co-worker. And you wonder why that co-worker being promoted because that co-worker went back to the boss and told him everything you said and you didn't even know it. Instead of respecting authority while you there, you allowed your tongue to cause you to go rogue and get you out of alignment with God and that's why your giftings have not been recognized. God is not in the business of allowing you to be gifted and not being used. He said, I'll, he said, I'll even bless those who bless you. Here's the season that God told me you're in. He said, Anthony, you're in a very sweet season of your life because when you practice surrender, you've moved into another level. Here's the level. I don't fight anybody anymore. By nature, I'm a lion. I like to fight. Ugh! But when I stop fighting people and people start doing me wrong and I start looking at their life after they have spoke against me, and they not smart enough to connect the dots, that you cannot do the man of God any kind of way and dishonor and think you're going to prosper. And whenever... I should have preached this at somebody else's church so they wouldn't think I was talking about me. But there is a oil that God gave me that I didn't ask for. Do you don't know how many times I wish I could be in your seat? Come to church when I want to. Give when I want to. Pay when I want to. Worship when I want to. That's more comfortable. But what happens when you got to carry the load if nobody shows up? What happens if you, fi- you got to figure out how to pay the bills if nobody tired? What happens if you got the work equipment if you ain't got no workers? What happens when you got to go pray for somebody you know that's been spreading nasty rumors about you? And you got to smile. What happens when you got to go preach the funeral of your enemy? Whoa. 
you better be careful with this disease of dishonor. You think you are getting away, but you're not. Because the enemy also blesses his kind. But the enemy blessings come to entrap you, but it will ultimately kill you. For the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I come that you might have life. Everybody stand in this house.